the recording is in progress. Uh, we have Austin, and do we have any other speakers online? We do not. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is the, the mini symposium. Um, not only this is for uh, for beginning students to, to, to figure out the group, but I think you know one of the things that a center like this one and any group like us has to do uh, is actually know in some broad sense what other people in our group are, are doing. Um, and so that's one of the, the functions that the um, that the brown bag serves in general. Uh, and this one in particular will give you a large swath uh, of the group all at once. And it's going to be quick talks, so four minutes plus one of questions. Um, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. So Mark is going to lead us off here. Uh, and so I'll just hand it over to him. This is Mark Williamson. Oh. And, uh, sorry. We have to share the screen, right? Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Share forensics. Only for the slides to turn off light. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, no? Okay. You just have to press in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. All right. Hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here in person. Uh, so my name is Mark. I'm a graduate student, and I'm working with Tyler Pritchard, who is a postdoc, uh, with Maria Mojas, who's the PI of the Stellar Forensics Group at NYU. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of a bunch of the different types of projects that we're working on. Um, this is kind of a wide variety of topics, um, so there's something for everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk about supernovae. So supernovae are the explosions of stars. Um, and a fundamental question common to all explosions, not just the ones that happen when stars die, is what was that? Um, and so one of these questions that we're trying to answer is what are the progenitors of these explosions? So what are the chemical compositions of the stars that give rise to these events? Um, if any of you are theoretically inclined, um, we do radiative transfer. So we work extensively with TARDIS, which is an open source radiative transfer group. Um, this is the sort of work that I do where we build models of the supernova ejecta and um, simulate the processes that photons go through as they progress through the ejecta uh, and compare the synthetic results to observations to try to understand what actually the star looked like when it exploded. Um, if you're more observationally inclined, we have a collaboration with the Las Cumbres Observatory through the Global Supernova Project. Um, so this is a collection of telescopes all over the world and researchers all over the US and also all over the world, um, where we follow up, observe supernovae and get spectra and photometry. Um, there's way more data than we could possibly write papers about. So if any of you like writing papers about interesting, weird supernovae, you should definitely come talk to us. Um, because there are tons of projects that you could get involved with. Um, some of you may think that you're not interested in supernova and have interest in other things, but actually you, you do have interest in supernova. So if you like galaxies, um, we do work on host galaxies. Um, Marian has led some extensive work on this topic, trying to connect the metallicity of the environments that the supernova go off in um, to the actual different types of supernovae that we observe. Um, if, like me, you're a thrill seeker and can't get out of bed for 10 to the 52 ergs, uh, we have more energetic explosions for you. So there are gamma ray bursts um, that happen in conjunction sometimes with broadline type 1c supernovae uh, and also superluminous supernovae. So they're uh, even more energetic than normal supernovae, and we don't really know why. There are a bunch of theories, and this is something that you could work on if that's the sort of thing you're interested in. Um, also, if you like black holes, so uh, our specialty in the stellar forensics group is core collapsed supernovae. And so uh, these are events that give rise to stellar mass black holes. Um, 
and you know, if you're interested in black holes or in gravitational waves, then uh, Mariam is working in collaboration with David Russell at NYU Abu Dhabi to do a um, project trying to understand X-ray binaries and their connection to supernovae. Uh, and finally, if three quarters of the way through your undergrad degree, you realize that you don't actually like physics, you like computer science instead, but now you're stuck in a dead end PhD. Um, <laughs> you can apply machine learning and AI to all of these topics. So um, I've done both observational and theoretical projects that make use of machine learning, um, both for classification and for modeling. Right now I'm working on using neural networks to build emulators for our radiative transfer code. Um, all of these projects have ample opportunity to make use of these new kinds of tools. Um, yeah, they can work really well. You get cool results. So, if there are any questions, I think I have like one minute left. Yeah. Questions from Art? I explained everything perfectly. Your PhD isn't really dead end, is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I very much enjoyed my PhD. I highly recommend it. <laughs> okay. You do work on the dead stars. I, yeah, dead stars. <laughs> Right. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we find you're in that, uh, but we're switching to the PDF. So. How do I do this? Tools? Yeah. Or view? And no, not slideshow. Full screen. Right. You want to go? Yeah. All right. We're good. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so I'm Ita Wang. I'm a new uh, faculty uh, in the high energy group at CCPP. And since, well, if you don't know me, I'm the one who was responsible for the making the whole tournament style like on fire this morning. <laughs> I think one important lesson I learned from here is that uh, you should never leave the microwave unintended. <laughs> okay, so hopefully what I'm going to say will be more interesting than the smoke. Um, so uh, apparently, since I'm the only uh, FDH faculty who's giving the mini symposium today, I thought I will start by giving uh, a brief introduction to what the faculties in the FDH group are up to. Um, so let me, and then I'll, uh, I will give some overview of what um, I'm recently interested in doing. Uh, okay, so let's start by a brief uh, introduction to what is FDH, so I think it's high energy physics theory. Broadly speaking, includes uh, theoretical particle physics and quantum gravity, and uh, mostly the most theoretical tools that are used are uh, quantum field theory and string theory. Okay, so there are five members within the energy group in SCCPP, uh, faculty members at SCCPP: uh, Sergey Dubovsky, uh, who's here, and Greg Kabatazi, and Matt. Uh, I don't think he's here. And Massimo and then and myself. Okay, and I should also say that uh, we have a new member joining us next year, Monica Pei. All right, so here are some recent research interests of uh, the faculty members within the HPH group at CCPP. Uh, so Sergey has been recently interested in understanding uh, strings in QCD, a uh, finding string QCD, and also interoperability uh, and TP, uh, TP, in particular the TP bar deformations of two dimensional quantum field theories. And he's also interested in the black hole lot numbers. Um, yeah, it's interesting names. And uh, Greg has been interested in massive gravity, cosmology, and holography. And, and Matt has been recently working on massive Schwinger models. And he's also very interested in cosmology and questions within a formal field theory. And uh, Massimo is, uh, has been interested in supergravity string theory. And uh, in particular, three dimensional transcendence theory, which is a particular kind of topological quantum field theory. And it's also interesting understanding asymptotic symmetries of four dimensional quantum field theories and gravities. Uh, it's also interesting in relation to cosmology. And uh, about myself, I'm recently most interested in understanding defects in quantum field theories and also notions of generalized symmetries. And the most of the tools I use involve conformal field theory and string theory. Uh, just to give a little uh, more details about my research, um, uh, so so the one kind of uh, key uh, uh, theme of my research is to understand the power of symmetries, which is a unifying principle for physics. So here, uh, what I focus on is understanding of generalized symmetries and anomalies, which includes <laughs> fine structures of symmetries, 
And this can be understood using tools from topological quantum field theories. And another uh, branch of my interest is conformal field theory, uh, which describe universal critical behaviors of quantum systems at second order phase transitions. And the tools that I use to study these such theories involve conformal bootstrap, uh, which, which uses a combination of analytic and numerical tools, and also in particular defects, uh, using, uh, studying defects using conformal bootstrap. And another kind of uh, uh, tool that I use is supersymmetry, uh, which uh, roughly speaking is some kind of exact degeneracy relates uh, bosons and fermions in your quantum system. And such a such a, a, a exact relation gives rise to some analytic results, which you can extract for supersymmetry theory, like supersymmetric cousins of the uh, quantum chromodynamics, which you can compute using localization and infer features, which can be uh, in four features that uh, carry similar similar uh, signatures in that uh, uh, non supersymmetric HDAs. And finally, uh, within string theory, uh, I'm particularly interested in understanding number of effects, such as from uh, deep ranks and instantons, and their role, the role they play in the context of dualities, which is a key ingredient for the consistency of string theory. And lastly, there's this recent interesting holographic correspondence. Which is some equivalence between quantum gravity or gravitational theory that, that uh, completes Einstein gravity in entity surface space in D plus one dimensions with a quantum system that is not gravitational on the boundary of D dimensions. So these are the rough overview of some things I'm interested in. Uh, and uh, feel free to email me uh, this email address or just come to chat with me at my office 906. Thank you. Any questions? Can you briefly say what conformal bootstrap is? Right. So, so, uh, so this uh, conformal field theories have this very rigid structure that's constrained by conformal symmetry, which is basically saying that uh, you know you have the dilatation symmetry, which dilates your lattice, but you also have them what's known as special conformal transformation, which uh, applies to the lattice goes to, uh, like give rise to some kind of deformed lattice of this form. This kind of symmetry principle can be used to constrain put strong constraint on what the, the, the kind of critical exponents are within this theory. And this approach is known as a conformal bootstrap. You just explore the powers of symmetry with minimal inputs, right? Um, right, so that's a, Any other questions? That's a short, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so this is all in one presentation now. Oh no, it's not you. It's oh, okay. Austin. Sorry, you have a reprieve. <laughs> you're after Austin. Um, yes, Austin, you're online, correct? Yes. Hello. Can everyone hear me? All right. Yes. And let me okay. let me let people see what? your face for a second. Okay. Uh, there you are. One one quick thing is I did have some videos so if this is in the uh, pdf those might not play can i share my screen really quick sure let's do it that way okay uh, i think you yeah, have to stop because i have to stop can you share your screen let me try now um real quick okay Okay, I think we are good now. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay, let me get my. Uh... There we go. Okay. You, we oh, can you guys are seeing that. Yeah. We, we so see you in presenter. Is that, is that better? That's good. Yes, there we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin McDowell. Um, I'm a fifth year working in Andrew McFadden's group on this. Um, also in the group. Uh, are Chris TD and Marcus DuPont. Um, they're both working on something different. So I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about what I do today. Um, so first of all, uh, real quick, what's a gamma ray burst? Um, like the name suggests, it's a burst of gamma ray photons um, in a short amount of time. They come in two kind of lengths. There are short bursts that last around two seconds and there are long bursts that last around 10 seconds. I'm gonna focus on the short bursts that come from uh, the merger of two neutron stars. Um, 
So what we're interested in particular is what's called the gamma ray burst afterglow. So how is this produced? Um, well, you see, you, everyone's seen this picture. You know, you have the two neutron stars. Uh, they coalesce and they merge. And then the compact object remnant launches a relativistic jet uh, past the merger remnant and into the interstellar medium. Um, and then this creates a shock wave in the ISM that accelerates electrons to relativistic speeds. Um, and those electrons produce synchrotron radiation um, at a bunch of different uh, frequencies. Um, so we can observe these things. So this is an observation of the afterglow from the neutron star merger GW170817. Uh, um, so the points here are the observed, uh, uh, observed values. And then these curves are, are actually uh, produced by the model that we use. Um, so what goes into the model are a bunch of different parameters uh, from like the energetics of the, the uh, relativistic jet that's lost, uh, uh, launched some radiation parameters, and then also some observable parameters like the, uh, the angle and the luminosity distance. Um, so what I do is I run a bunch of these hydro simulations to model the outflow uh, into the ISM, um, and then I can post-process these and do radiative transfer. Um, and then from this radiative transfer, uh, I can create a huge table of spectral values. And then from those spectral values, I can create a light curve for pretty much any given value of our model parameters um, extremely quickly. So doing this really quickly allows us to actually use uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, sampling to kind of step through our parameter space and find these, whoops, and find these uh, light curves that best fit uh, the data. Um, so from that, we get uh, uh, posterior distributions for all of our model parameters, and we can constrain a lot of really interesting stuff like the energy, like I said, the energy of the jet, kind of the opening angle of the jet. Um, in the, the observer angle. Um, and these have implications across cosmology and also kind of figuring out what kind of environments these, uh, these, these things happen in. Um, so yeah, that's about it. I think I'm almost at four minutes. So if there's any, any questions, I'm happy to, happy to take them. Any questions for Austin? Where's today on that graph? Oh, today is way, way far uh, over here. This is kind of an older, this is an older plot. There are, there are some more recent uh, observations that I see where... haven't added to this yet, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Austin. Mm -hmm. to... Now it is, in fact, you, Gronis. Um, let me just, there you go. Your slides are up, and so you can just use the arrow okay. on this. this okay. 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 Move okay. Austin's. Thank you. Oh, hi, Austin. <laughs> I'll move Austin's second. <laughs> um, there's an extremely active and exciting field of uh, particle astrophysics and astroparticle physics. And they're, similar sides at the same time. Um, and there's so much going on. Two major areas of projects have just been completed with students are finishing with papers that have made a major impact on their respective fields. So that, so plenty of things to pick up in that area, but I think I'll talk about new projects that we're thinking about doing. But since many people may not be all that familiar with this, I wanted to give you a feeling so let's see, is it showing just my screen? I'm seeing other people's faces, but I guess this is not showing another people's screen. So. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, okay. yeah. Okay, I just wanna. Um, so, well, I just make a quick comment that in general, in my experience, fields have the most explosive growth and the most exciting opportunities when either they're very rich experimentally or at certain special moments, 
a new theoretical idea can just sort of totally transform the field. And I would say that particle astrophysics, or particle physics, is in a, for a decade, has been on a roll, especially with respect to observations. So alternative cosmic rays is, is an area that uh, we've done a lot of work on in this group. One thing I want to stress is the, the discovery of binary neutron star mergers and their observation is really pulled, thrown open a new field, really, of understanding the neutron star equation of state. That is to say, it's a merger of the deepest particle theory problems of how do you compute the behavior of QCD <laughs> when the number density of quarks is unimaginably bigger than a nuclei. So that's got um, a number of observational input now, and there will be thousands of more <clears throat> gravitational waves that will be probing this. Um, Neutrino astrophysics has been really important. Anyway, so I'm going to move ahead. The group is fun. I don't have the name, uh, pictures of the newest uh, members of the group. Uh, Marco has just uh, graduated recently, and, and I don't have a picture of uh, Jay. He's also graduating. Anyway, it's a, also a fun field. So the topics I would love to talk about in greater detail are the ones in red because those are sort of new. The other ones are active and ongoing. Um, and so I'll just be, be incomplete. A very important piece of work was done by Nicolas Loiseau, who's now moving into quantum, uh, unless we induce him to come back, um, by looking at data on the rotation curves of a large number of galaxies and actually treating them systematically for the first time, it exposed that very likely there's a disk of dark matter and not just a spherical dark matter distribution. That still has to be confirmed with some other tests we're doing, but that opens the question, does just the interactions through gravity enough to make that structure? It's a, probably a very puffy disk, so there are papers showing there's not a thin disk. I see Oren looking for per, but that's the, it's, no, no, it's the thin no, disk. It's a thin disk. <laughs> and so Cammie Norton, a new student, has been looking into the very best simulations of galaxy formation to make Milky Way-like galaxies. These are all the big diversity of galaxies that Nikolai looked at. Um, to find out in those simulations, maybe, you, maybe there are disks of dark matter that come about through gravitational interactions. If they're not, then that's a really important <coughs> clue that there may be interactions, direct interactions between baryons and dark matter. Um, a topic that I become more and more enamored about and originally started working on it as just a, pro a possibility that maybe couldn't be excluded, but it's looking better and better is the possibility that there's actually been a, st a stable hadron um, called a sexaquark by me uh, to distinguish it from earlier proposals of a loose di-lambda molecule with, made of the same up-down strange quarks. And it turns out this gives a beautiful no free parameters result for what the actual observed dark matter is with, with um, Z-Way Wang is, is calculating the mass and the structure, and Ching Chen Shu has been working on limits. And so it turns out this it, it accepts all, it's fine with all the direct detection limits for now. So there's a huge amount of things to do. With Andy Haas, we're designing a way that using their new apparatus, Milliken, they can try to detect a very, you, you would think, how could there be a hadron that we missed? But it's neutral. It's probably produced at like a level of one over 300 or less of neutrons, and its interactions are weak. But when it does interact, it looks like a neutron. Anyway, so that's an open and exciting field. This is just highlighting some work that um, Marco Musio did, looking at ultra energy cosmic ray and neutrino observations. We get an interesting new type of constraint on the sources of ultra energy cosmic rays. Again, asking for to be uh, followed up. An area that we haven't done any work on at NYU for a number of years now is the magnetic field of the Milky Way. And wonderfully, uh, one of your predecessors, an NYU graduate student, uh, Ronnie Jensen, um, and I discovered 
a major component of the galactic magnetic field that had been assumed to not exist, um, namely a coherent toroidal component. <clears throat> and so this is a very rich, it's a difficult subject to uh, make progress on, but I think this is a good moment. And, and all of these things I've mentioned, there's very ample funding. I have three different GRAs. Uh, um, this is a short list of some of the outstanding new types of projects, and then there's lots of other types of projects. Questions for Gonis? Broad range. <laughs> All right, let's move on. I have now forgotten. Who's next? It's somewhere on the list of the people on online, probably know. Uh, it's Abby. Like, like a nice little surprise. <laughs> uh, right. So I'm um, Abhishek Mania. I'm a postdoc. You can call me Abhi. Uh, I'm a postdoc here at CCPP working with uh, Professor Anthony Pudan. He's my postdoc advisor. Uh, and our broad theme uh, of research is cosmology and galaxy evolution. Uh, Anthony could not be here today, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about his work uh, and what we are doing together. Uh, and our group is uh, Anthony, uh, then uh, myself, then we recently Patrick joined us, uh, who is a postdoc here, and then uh, Yu Cheng uh, and Chang are the PhD students. I'm sorry if I forgot to uh, mention Eka Pope's name, but he is also part of the group. And then again recently, Ami, uh, Ami and uh, Elan joined us for a couple of projects. They, these are recent uh, students at uh, CCPP. And we also have an undergrad, uh, Tony, working with us. So uh, what do I mean when I say cosmology and galaxy evolution? It's a very broad term. So I'm going to just mention uh, very briefly what, what, what I mean by cosmology. So we basically uh, try to deal with the large scale structure of the universe, uh, figuring out how the, uh, how the matter is distributed <laughs> in the universe. And uh, our universe is described, it seems, by six parameters, which, which the model is called the lambda CDM model. So how can we constrain those parameters? And how can we test gravity at different scales? Uh, and the tools we use for this, uh, for doing this kind of cosmology is the something called cosmic microwave background, uh, which if you don't know, you will soon learn uh, in your classes, I hope. And uh, then we also use cos cosmic microwave background, by the way, is like the relic, relic light of the Big Bang. Then we have something called cosmic infrared background, which is the relic right from all the star formation in the universe. Then there is a really exciting tool, uh, which is taking shape. It's called line intensity mapping. Anthony is heavily involved uh, in, in line intensity mapping techniques. And Patrick today, I guess, will talk about this. Uh, so, and then we also use galaxy surveys. And one of, one of the things which is my favorite thing to do is like combining different probes to do cool stuff. Now this is the cosmology side. Then we also have galaxy evolution side where we try to do it with questions like, uh, what is the star formation history? Like we see that star formation peaked at some point in the past and then it has been declining since then. What causes that? Then uh, how, how, are this, uh, how, is, how does the star formation happen on small scales through interstellar medium properties based on the, what kind of gas you have, what kind of uh, temperature does the dust have at different redshifts? And then we, we like to model those things. Uh, and the tools we use for this is again, the major tool is line intensity mapping. Uh, uh, then we have, we use semi-analytical semi simulations and again, cosmic infrared background because it's the light from the stars and galaxy surveys, of course. Uh, I'll briefly mention one of the projects, uh, one of the results we recently had uh, with Anthony. So if you don't know what a redshift is, uh, which is here on this scale the, uh, on the top. Just know that it's a proxy for a distance. Uh, so as you, we, we are here on the left leftmost side at distance zero, and then this is the higher uh, the higher you go on on x axis, the the this part, the, the 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 more distant linear you are seeing. And you should also forget what this k lim and k cmd mean here. Just know that. What I'm trying to tell you here is we have combined something called line intensity, ma line intensity mapping tool 
with some something called cosmic micro background to show that we can combine these tools at different redshift to extract information only from the high redshift part. So we can construct something, we can subtract, we can null the whole contribution coming from the low redshift part and get the map of the whole matter in the universe only coming from the high redshift part. Because, and why is that important? Because as you can see, galaxy surveys are able to measure galaxies going up to redshift, let's say two or something. But higher you go in redshift, higher you go in distance, it becomes difficult to probe the matter and to probe the galaxies. So it's cool to have some tool which can do it, which can do, uh, which can perform this task for us. So we can go really, we can look at the very distant universe. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff we work on. And again, so if you're interested in any of these things, uh, talk to us, that's Anthony, that's me. Uh, these are uh, our offices and uh, yeah. Feel free to chat anytime. We have questions for Avi. Your high redshift information you get is that is that statistical information like you get a a, a peer, like some power spectrum information right. or can you map? Yeah, so this is uh, because this is a weak lens in Kappa reference weak lensing, so we get we get a projected map and also yeah. the power spectrum. Okay, oh, okay, which is useful for a lot of. Cosmological things. Cool. But go to the next slide and we'll find out who's next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Story Fisher. I'm a fifth year PhD student here, and I work with both David Hogg and Jeremy Tinker, well, other spots at NYU, uh, primarily on cosmology using both data science and statistical methods. Um, so I've already kind of did some good intros for me on uh, large scale structure and uh, cosmology, but I'll repeat a little bit of that. So um, the data that I mostly work with is galaxy redshift surveys. So this gives us the distribution of galaxies on the sky and their clustering information or their clustering contains information about uh, the cosmology, the underlying cosmological model. Um, but to extract that, we need to use cosmological simulations uh, in which we input the model and we can see what kind of structure we get out. Um, and so this is an image of um, one of these cosmological simulations, but this is just with the dark matter um, because also modeling the hydrodynamics of galaxies is really, really expensive. Um, so I work um, one of the things I work on is different ways to populate these uh, end body simulations with galaxies so that we can do this comparison between our real observable surveys and our simulations. Um, and then what do we want out from uh, this uh, project is cosmological parameters. So um, some of these are like the density of dark matter in the universe overall, or the amplitude of uh, clustering, or oh, sorry, amplitude of fluctuations on a particular scale. Then we also want to marginalize over um, galaxy bias parameters, because I don't care as much about galaxy formation, but if you care about galaxy formation, you want to keep those parameters around and learn something about how galaxies form as well. Um, another thing that I'm interested in is how we can use this to detect deviations from lambda CDM. Um, so we can parameterize, um, uh, for example, non-GR uh, mm -hmm. in order to constrain uh, those deviations. We can also try to find um, inhomogeneities and anisotropies um, that would show that our model of an uh, isotropic and homogeneous universe is wrong um, and other fun things like that. Um, so the general vibe of my research and the research, um, or some of the research at least, of, of Hogg and Tinker is um, to do uh, or do inference to go from the data that we have to these outputs that we want using uh, by developing new methods um, in statistics and data science. So this is just a sampling of the projects that I worked on with David Hogg, um, but I should say Hogg likes to say that he works on data-driven astrophysics at all scales. So these are things on the more cosmological scales, but um, these ideas could be applied at smaller scales. Um, I don't over here is working with Hogg on exoplanets, um, so the very opposite scales that I work on. Um, but one of the projects I worked on is developing a new estimator for galaxy clustering um, from the correlation function. Uh, so that allows us to extract uh, more precise and accurate information from galaxies just using uh, statistics. Um, one of the more recent projects working on is how to encode the physical symmetries that we know should exist, like rotation and translation symmetry in the universe. 
um, into our machine learning models. So this is not cosmology, this is just a double pendulum, um, but we show that our model can predict well the path of this chaotic pendulum, and we're now looking to apply this to um, cosmological simulations. Um, and then finally, um, another project we're interested in is how to do inference from um, dark gravitational wave sirens. So these are gravitational waves without ENM counterparts, but by correlating them with large scale structure, we can learn things um, about the cosmology just from a small sample of these uh, dark sirens. So I know that was all really quick, but that was just a little idea because um, I want to be able to get to my research with Jeremy Tinker, who works on a lot of things around cosmology using galaxy surveys to do cosmo or to um, perform cosmological inference. So one of the main projects is the Emulus project, which is emulation of galaxy statistics. So Mark mentioned emulation with TARDIS. Um, and the basic idea of this is we can train a model, a neural network, or a Gaussian process to um, quickly emulate the output of these really expensive cosmological simulations. Um, and so what uh, we use this to do is to be able to uh, recover parameters based on our observations of um, summer statistics from the uh, real surveys. So for example, this is a sneak peek of the latest result of Amulus um, that uh, John Zai, who is an old student here, um, did, which is um, using our, our latest suite and emulator to um, get new constraints from the boss data. And we actually find a much lower sigma eight than in, in Planck does. So that's an interesting tension. Um, yeah, and the work I do is kind of a subset of this, which is incorporating new density-based statistics to emulate and see if we can get more information from it. Um, yeah, that was a very quick overview of these things. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come talk to me. Any questions right now? All right, let's find out who's next. I don't think it's, uh, we have to check. Maybe Trey. I think it might be. Yes, it is Trey. All right. It's Trey, and then, oh no, we skipped Hong Wan. Right, yeah, well, I should go just before, right? Else. Okay. Okay, we'll do Trey, and then we'll do Hong Wan, yep. and then we'll do Art. Okay. Do I need to talk into this microphone or just anywhere? I think it picks you up everywhere. Okay. So cool. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Trey Jensen. I'm working with uh, Yassine Ali Ahmoud, who's sitting right over there. Um, the research that I'm currently doing is um, trying to constrain dark matter candidates that extend beyond just interacting gravitationally. Um, so this would be like dark matter that could annihilate or decay into photons or electron positrons. Um, and more interestingly, um, I'm considering dark matter candidates uh, such as primordial black holes, which are uh, black holes that would have formed shortly after inflation from some over densities. And we're considering masses of like one solar mass to a thousand solar mass where these black holes would be accreting matter and they would convert that matter into photons to just uh, heating up plasma essentially. Um, but the important aspect here is that the dark matter is somehow injecting some electromagnetically interacting particles throughout the cosmic time. Now, um, to explain how I actually put constraints on these types of dark matter candidates, I'm gonna kind of explain the physics of the CMB. So in the very, very early universe, we have essentially a homogeneous plasma. It's very, very hot, it's ionized. And we have some photons that are trying to propagate, but they're interacting with these very, very dense liberated electrons. And so essentially these photons are locked into place into this plasma. Eventually, because of the expansion of the universe, um, this plasma cools down and the protons and electrons combine and make a neutral hydrogen. And this process is called recombination. Um, once recombination happens, the photons now see like a, a neutral background. And so these photons can finally propagate and propagate to our telescopes on Earth. Now, um, the important aspect there is that um, depending on when recombination happens, we actually will end up seeing a different CMB. And so now we have these two pictures of this dark matter that being, might be annihilating, decaying, or somehow injecting some energy, and we have recombination. So if we have energy, additional energy injection, this energy might actually change when uh, recombination happens. And so if you change when recombination happens, we're gonna see a different CMB. And so my research is specifically trying to do, propagate some, some uh, dark matter model to something observable, which is the CMB that we see. And so this takes a lot, of, a lot of theory from a lot of different topics, because for example, with primordial black holes, you have the astrophysics of uh, accretion models. Um, additionally, I have to think about how um, photons interact with the plasma, so I have a lot of plasma physics, a lot of electron microphysics, 
And then finally, we're trying to do some cosmological observable. And so I have to do a lot of cosmology as well with statistics and some differential equations, et cetera. So if any of these topics are interesting to you guys, feel free to talk to me and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any questions? That's fine. Okay, great. So I'm going to go low tech and use the uh -huh. uh, <laughs> Also, very conveniently, um, Orange plus Light is up, and I'm going to say exactly that. So, um, <laughs> the two of us combined are going to tell you about uh, particle phenomenology. Um, and so, particle phenomenology, uh, we're talking about who are the faculty members who are interested in this topic? There is uh, Josh, Neil, um, and Ken. And then, of course, there are, um, you know, uh, Glennis working on topics both in phenomenology and astroparticle physics. As you've seen, who does um, particle phenomenology um, in the cosmological context? There's Carl, who does uh, experimental particle physics, but using a lot of um, data science to inform um, particle phenomenology. Um, and Sergey used to do a lot of stuff on uh, many charged particles and probably has plenty of new ideas as well. Um, and a bunch of postdocs, a bunch of students. Um, or we'll go through the, the list of um, uh, main people who do work on this, on this front. Okay, so the basic idea is um, we know um, that we've discovered a standard model, which is a really good model for all particle physics that we know of. Um, we also have um, a cosmological standard model um, for the entire history of the uh, universe. Um, but we know um, from studying the standard model, from studying Lambda CDM, which is the, the cosmological model, we know that there's plenty that's missing. Um, we know that this stuff is incomplete. And in particular, um, we know, for example, that neutrinos must have masses, but we don't know where the masses come from. We know that there is. Um, matter antimatter asymmetry. Uh, we don't know if, in particular why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe today. Um, we know that there's something called dark energy, possibly a cosmological constant, and that is, has a really tiny value, and we don't know why. Um, there's something called the hierarchy problem, uh, which is a question of why is the Higgs mass so unnaturally light. Um, and then uh, a combination of looking at lambda CM and this end model, um, tells you that there's something called dark matter, which makes up 80% of all matter in the universe. We don't know what it is. Um, and so these are the questions that we're really interested in, in finding the answers to. Um, and the, the philosophy of phenomenology is to um, look for the answers um, guided by any kind of experiments. So inside this box, there are a ton of things um, that I'm not able to go through. Uh, you know, spanning um, uh, experiment like terrestrial experiments um, in order to go through some of these, um, all the way to astrophysics and cosmology. And so one of the fun things is, you know, because we, we are interested in so many data sets, so many different things that we're looking for, um, we talk to a lot of different people. Um, and so we intersect uh, with a lot of different people uh, in the center. So for this talk, I'm just going to tell you about cosmological data. So that's just one particular aspect um, that we use to look at, um, you know, try to figure out answers uh, to what this might be. Okay. And there's sort of like three reasons why you would want to use cosmological data to, to do this. Um, first of all, um, it's very precise. Well, parts of it's very precise, especially um, measurements of the CMB energy spectrum. Um, uh, that Avi told you about just now, as well as the uh, CMB power spectrum. So these two things uh, have been measured very, very precisely, and we like to use uh, these data sets to tell us, you know, to set constraints on what we think uh, is down here. Um, another thing is that the universe um, is relatively simple and relatively cold. These are all relative, um, but, you know, compared to some uh, uh, you know, some terrestrial experiments that you could set up. Uh, these are uh, relatively true. Um, and also, 
uh, one of the things that's unique about, about using the universe to probe uh, what's going on here is that it gives you long length and time scales. And this is really unique. I mean, you can't get longer time scales than the universe. 13 billion years or something that happened and for you to look for consequences of those kinds of time scales. So that's why uh, we enjoy, uh, that's why cosmological data is, is, is good. Okay, so what kinds of things uh, can we look for? Am I running out of time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so two broad things. It's just a dark matter. So what can dark matter do? Um, you know, we have all kinds of models for what dark matter, matter might do, but it could annihilate into high energy particles. It could scatter off regular particles. Um, and we could look for the effects of these processes, including ionization, heating, um, and much more. And this impacts a bunch of different cosmological signatures, including uh, BBN, CMB that I pointed out above, uh, 21 CM, uh, Lyman alpha, forest, um, line intensity mapping as well. So all kinds of cosmological probes are possible to look for such interactions and more. And the other thing that we do know from cosmology is the abundance of dark matter, which we know very, very well. It's something like um, 0 0.26 plus minus some number here that's like an accuracy uh, precision of about 1%. Um, and so this sets a really good you know, uh, benchmark that says you know, any model that you can write down, um, you really want uh, to get the right abundance because that's the one thing that you know. And so um, we have a lot of expertise here in building the right models, calculating how you know, interacting particles in the expanding universe um, can give you the right abundance. Um, and we build models to motivate, um, well, build models that are motivated by both uh, theory and experiment. Um, so please come talk to us and um, also Oren will continue telling you more about particle phenomenology. Thank you. Any questions? But a question is what role has still, if any, supersymmetry and supergravity and all these constraints that were very popular in the 90s and 80s? in building models of that matter? Um, I would say that they are very useful as like examples of certain kinds of models that you're interested in. So people are still very interested, for example, um, uh, we know and you know uh, dark matter candidates. Um, uh, so that's like sort of the motivation that some people have at the back of their minds. Um, but also sort of uh, right now, people kind of think about it sort of more generally. So like when people think about Wino's, they don't necessarily think about the supersymmetric partner of the W, but they also think in terms of like a general electroweak uh, triplet, uh, for example. Um, so that's a kind of like state that we're in now, but who knows, you know, if we, if we discover some signature of supersymmetry, we might swing back and start, you know, digging up these supersymmetric models again and taking them very, very seriously. This figure, which has a circle which contains all theory, including everything we haven't discovered, and a square which includes all experiments. <laughs> very, <laughs> very comprehensive diagram. Okay, so hi, uh, I'm Oren. I'm also like Hong Wan, postdoc here at CCPT. And I'm going to try and complement a little bit of what Hong Wan said. Uh, so we tried to coordinate, I think it kind, of, kind of worked out. So, okay, basically everything that's on the slide is what Hongwan already mentioned. Um, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, what am I doing wrong? Uh, just use the arrows. Oh, good. Okay, so yeah, so here are some examples, right, of uh, things that kind of guide us in phenomenology to search for new physics. And uh, yeah, Hongwan basically mentioned all of these things in his list over here. Uh, and I'm going to focus just on some examples within uh, searching for dark matter. Uh, so, you know, how does one go ahead and search for dark matter? So there's, there's various ways, but just one way of categorizing this is you can think about the question, you know, does dark matter interact at some level with the standard model? And if dark matter does interact at some level, you can draw a diagram kind of like this, kind of along the lines of these processes that Hongwan wrote down over here. And then you can just think about trying to search for dark matter 
by changing the direction of time in this diagram. So if time goes from left to right, let's just describe the scattering curves, right? Dark matter, the standard models scatter with each other, and uh, you know some energy and momentum is transferred between the two sectors. And then you can search for that uh, transfer of energy and momentum, and that's just known as direct detection. And then you can think of the direction of time being you know, either from top to bottom, so dark matter producing standard model particles, or from bottom to top, where the standard model you know, produces dark matter, for example, at the LHC, you can search for those things, and that's known as indirect detection and production. And then there are additional probes, which I want to also mention, which involve you know, looking at the sky and asking how do dark matter models affect the behavior of astrophysical objects of you know, just the general properties of cosmology. But let me just give two examples, um, which are you know, along the lines of direct detection and astrophysics. And so the idea in direct detection is that you take, the, you build a very sensitive detector, you shield it from the world, you put it deep underground. So dark matter is really the only kind of thing that can reach it efficiently. And then you search for uh, depositions of energy into your detector. So this is an example of a time projection chamber. And typically you fill these things with something like liquid xenon. You put it you know, a few kilometers underground and then the incoming particle can ionize, for example, and you search for emission of light and the electron that gets ionized in your detector. So this is, you know, kind of technology that's been around for a long time. And in recent years, in the recent uh, 10 years or so, people have been proposing new technologies to do very similar things, but search in regions of parameter space that are currently unconstrained. And so an example of a project that I was involved in about a year and a half ago is the use of uh, very cold diatomic molecules. So the idea is you make a chamber with gaseous diatomic molecules and dark matter interact with the molecules, excite them to some vibrational rotational mode, and then you search for IR photons that are emitted during the de-excitation process. So this is just one example, and it's sensitive to about an order or two of magnitude in lower mass than is currently available um, for direct detection um, setups. So this is one example. Um, and then just moving over kind of to the more astrophysical side to things that Hong Wan and Glenn have talked about, you can imagine, you know, the dark matter, for example, doesn't even interact with the standard model at all, except through gravitation. And then you can ask the question, you know, if dark matter, for example, interacts with itself strongly, what kind of uh, signature would that leave on astrophysical objects? So I was involved recently in a project where we asked that question. Uh, with respect to satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. So we asked the question, if dark matter interacts with itself uh, kind of efficiently and it can transfer heat within its own sector, what would that do to observations of small dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way? And um, this is the result, uh, or this is one of our main results from the paper uh, with these authors that we published recently. And um, this plot is just the it just parameterizes aspects of the dark matter model. Mm -hmm. So it's ratios of the masses and the couplings uh, within the model. And basically, we were able to rule out a big chunk of the parameter space, just given measurements of central densities of dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way, and actually point to a kind of preferred region over here, if this model does describe nature, which has its own uh, observational consequences. Uh, so it's kind of really interesting that that's where um, it this point. Um, yeah, and I think I'm not going to say really anything else about all of this, um, but I'd love to chat with any, anyone about, you know, any of these topics that Hongwan and I talked about. Uh, there's a ton of new data that's going to be released over the next decade, so there's a lot of kind of ideas, um, projects, and I think these are the members of the group. Uh, I did add Venice, but I forgot to add people who work with Glimmers. So sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks. We're almost out of time, but we have enough time for Patrick. Just enough time. Just enough time. All right. Last talk. Um, my name is Patrick Ricey. I'm a postdoc here. I've been here for a year, but given the last year, you know, it's Still feels kind of new. Um, there's a lot of things on the screen. 
Um, so as uh, Abhishek said earlier, I um, spend basically all of my time thinking about line intensity mapping stuff and cool science we can do with that. Um, so to very briefly explain what that really boring sounding name refers to, you know, if this is a, say a toy simulation of just a population of galaxies out in space, every dot is the location of a galaxy. If I do kind of traditional astronomy, I point my telescope over here, I pick out every galaxy I can find that's above my noise threshold and say that gives me the locations of, say, the, the ones marked in red. And, you know, I can do power spectra on that. I can look at, you know, how bright they are in different emission lines and do, of course, tons of fascinating science. But as you, you know, there's this highly technical problem in astronomy that far away stuff is hard to see. So the farther and farther you look away, the smaller refraction of galaxies you're seeing in these ones marked in red. But all these fainter galaxies in gray, they're still emitting photons. Those photons are still hitting your detector. You're just throwing out that information because you can't say with confidence as a galaxy here. The idea of intensity mapping is to basically say, I don't care about taking pictures of galaxies anymore. I'm going to make an intentionally kind of crappy resolution map of this same bit of space. And I'm just going to look at the you know, overall aggregate fluctuations in intensity instead of trying to find individual point sources. And so you can see, you know, these kind of orange blobs over here, they trace the same, you know, statistical structure, but there are areas over here where I can see emission in my intensity map that I don't see in the galaxy survey. And what this lets you do is this lets you make statistical measurements of the aggregate properties of all of the galaxies um, in the high redshift universe instead of being limited to the few brightest ones. Um, and so given my rapidly decreasing amount of time just to quickly run through yeah, some of the buzzwords okay. some of the buzzwords um, you get out of that um, so we had a paper I had a paper with some of the NYU group here that just came out a couple of months ago um, using an intensity mapping measurement to look at the total amount of molecular gas in the universe molecular gas being what stars are made out of therefore very important for understanding galaxies this black line is kind of a best fit from direct kind of normal astronomy measurements and just using a model for the int an intensity mapping data set that existed, we got way more molecular gas in the universe. Um, it's a very weak, very early measurement, um, but it's, you know, kind of fun. But the other half of that paper was basically saying, oh yeah, there's my circle. The other half of that paper was basically saying galaxies are really complicated. What we really need to do is um, also improve our modeling of high range of galaxies and how we can inform it with measurements like this. Um, so I've been working with Anthony's group and Abhishek and others on these um, really high quality semi-analytic models of galaxy evolution um, to uh, kind of inform and interpret the results of these surveys that are coming out. Um, we also think a lot about kind of fundamental cosmology things. This is a figure from a paper a couple of years ago, uh, looking at the expansion history of the universe. Basically, the red lines are what you get, you know, what's allowed in a world without intensity mapping. The blue lines are what's allowed in the world with it. Blue lines are a lot skinnier than the red. Therefore, you know, maybe there's some exotic early dark energy we could look for. And um, for people, hello. Here's Sorry, the parallel is, means there is no exotic that right? So this is a this is a model. This is a model of a lambda CDM constraints around the lambda CDM cosmology. Well, so you could look. You're, you're not saying there's a hint for. I'm not saying there's a hint for. I'm okay. saying if, if you could if you could actually do this measurement, yeah. you could look for it. It's no longer letting me advance. I don't quite know why. You know that. Yeah, that's weird. Um, it's nope. quite possible I did not copy your very last slide. Okay, well, there's a fourth <laughs> one here, which is uh, just basically saying there's a new cross correlation estimator we're working on that's the ratio of the Fourier transform of two histograms. So if that sounds like a fun thing to hear about, talk to me. It, it sounds like a thing that would have benefited with, from an illustration. From an illustration. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last slide was going to be basically that I had pictures of. You know, this is, I, I primarily work on theory. This is a very fun theoretical topic. There's a lot of things, but it's also a um, very exciting instrumental uh, experimental field right now. I'm um, glad I said a field earlier. A field gets really interesting when there's a sudden explosion in experimental data. And I think I had like six or eight different experiments on that slide. Um, and the nice thing about it is, you know, a lot of CMB, a lot of cosmology um, observations these days are these, you know, huge really powerful but immense collaborations whereas these are oh there it is these are a bunch of just kind of like especially 
um, like the CMF project we're releasing our early data in a few in a few weeks. Uh, a bunch of you know, really nice kind of smaller collaborations that are really fun to get involved in and make a big impact right away because we're still kind of just figuring out what we're doing. And then finally, since this is up, there's still not even there is a picture of me and Anthony's group. Um, <laughs> there it is. For anybody on Zoom, this is an actual picture of me. Um, <laughs> the people I've been working with for the last year or so include um, people from Anthony's group, also Rachel Somerville at CCA and um, Anthony's recent student, Cheng Shi Yang. Um, if any of that extremely fast brain dump sounds remotely interesting to either old or new CCPP members, feel free to come talk to me. Thanks a lot. All right. That schedule went easier than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, we will have, start having regular brown bags next week, starting with Zubar Fati. He's not here right now, I don't think. But they'll be talking about uh, recast stuff, I think, uh, the stuff they're doing with Kyle. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>